So far, we've solved the two-body problem, and we saw that solutions for that two-body problem were um, conic sections, so hyperbolas, parabolas, ellipses, and circles for things that are orbiting each other. And on our and part of our motivation for solving the two-body problem was to find the Lagrange points of something in the Earth-Sun system. Uh, but to find those Lagrange points, we're going to treat the two-body problem that we found as kind of a background potential. And we're going to be inserting a mass much smaller than the mass of the Earth and the Sun, for example, a satellite. And we're going to be solving the restricted three-body problem. But before we do that, um, if we are inserting a smaller mass into the two-body problem, we are going to need to embed that mass into a rotating coordinate system. And so today, we're going to talk about um, what your Lagrangian looks like in a rotating coordinate system. So if we start with this coordinate system, And so for this proof that I'm doing, the primed coordinate system, so x, y, and z prime, this is going to be the stationary coordinate system. And the x, y, and z without the primes are going to be the rotating coordinate system. And so these are, this coordinate system is rotating about the z axis at a speed omega. And these, this angle between x and xt is going to be omega t. And so you, in textbooks, you might see the, the prime written as the rotating system, or the rotating coordinate system, and the unprimed as the stationary system. And that's fine. Uh, I'm writing it this way because um, in the proof that I'm going to do, I'm going to be solving for things in the rotating coordinate system. And if I did that and I labeled them with primes, I would have to write a bunch of primes over and over again. And that would get very tedious and I don't want to do that. So instead, I'm labeling things like this. So in the, so we have these two coordinate systems now, and we want to know how to transform from one coordinate system to the other. So we have two different coordinate systems, one that's stationary and one that's rotating. And we need to be able to translate from one system to the other. So if we are given the, coordinates in the rotating system. So if we are given coordinates in the stationary system, we can find the coordinates in the rotating system using these two equations. X equals X prime cosine of omega t plus y prime sine of omega t. 
And then for the y, it's y prime cosine of omega t plus negative x prime sine of omega t. And then z is just z prime, so there's no transformation there. And then if we want to go from the stationary, if we're given the rotating coordinates, we want to go to the stationary coordinates, x prime equals x cosine of omega t minus y sine of omega t. And then y prime equals y cosine of omega t plus x sine of omega t. And z goes to z prime. Yeah. And so we can check to see if this makes sense. So whenever omega t equals 0, for the x coordinate, cosine of 0 would be 1. So you would get that the x, the rotating and the stationary coordinate system line up because the y term goes to 0. And then same for the y term, cosine of 0 would be 1. So you would get y equals y prime. And then you can also have the situation where omega t equals uh, 90 degrees. And so you would get sine of 90 is 1. So you would get your uh, rotating x coordinate is actually lined up with your station on your y, and then vice versa for the, the y coordinate. So this makes logical sense. And now I'm going to take this transformation, and we're going to plug that into our Lagrangian to see what the behavior of the um, what the equations of the motion will be for a particle in the rotating coordinate system. So if we start with our Lagrangian in the stationary coordinates. Our Lagrangian is one half m times x dot squared plus y dot squared plus c dot squared, and these are all primed. And then you would have a potential if you had one, but we're just going to ignore the potential for now. And so now what we want to do is replace these x dot primes with the transformations that we defined earlier. The y dot prime, again, we'll transform it. So it won't go directly to x, it'll be some complicated formula. And then z dot prime will just go to z because that's a nice, easy one to transform. Okay, so let's start uh, that process. So we have these definitions. for x prime and y prime.
So first, let's write down the x dot prime. So take the time derivative of this, and we get x dot cosine omega t. The derivative of so now if we take the derivative of cosine, we would get negative sine. So x omega sine of omega t. And the omega we pull out because we did the derivative of cosine, and then you have to multiply by the derivative inside. So that's where the omega comes from. Then we have negative y dot sine of omega t and then a negative y omega cosine of omega t. Okay, now we have to square that x dot prime squared. And now I'm going to color code this because it's there's going to be a lot of terms and then we're going to have to do the y terms as well and if I color code them, we'll be able to quickly see which, uh, which ones go together. Okay, so if I square this first, so what I'm going to do first is just square each term, and then we'll do the cross terms. So x dot squared cosine of cosine squared omega t and red. <coughs> Then in black, we've got x squared sine squared of omega t times omega squared. Blue, we've got y dot squared sine squared of omega t. And in orange, we've got y squared omega squared cosine squared of omega t. Okay, so those are all the squared terms. Now we have to do the cross terms. So in yellow, I'm taking this first term and multiplying it by the second term, and there will be two of those. So two x dot times x omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t. Then in light blue, we've got this first term times the third term, so and the two, and it'll be negative x dot y dot sine of omega t cosine of omega t. Then in light green, we've got the first term times the last term. So negative 2 x dot y omega cosine of omega t. Now in dark green, we've got so we've done the first term time e times each of the next terms. So now we'll do the second term times the third and the fourth. <clears throat> so that gives us two x y dot omega sine squared omega t. Then mm, I guess purple will do two x. Uh, so the first times the last two x y omega squared sine of omega t cosine of omega t, and then the last term in pink will be. 2y dot y 
omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t. So if you looked at all of these terms, you'll see that none of them are going to cancel out or anything. Uh, but when we go into the, when we start doing stuff with the y direction, then you'll start to see some connections. So, so y dot prime, so we'll take the time derivative of this y prime equation up at the top. So that gives us y dot cosine of omega t minus y omega sine of omega t plus x dot sine of omega t plus x omega cosine of omega t. All right. Now we'll color code things again for y dot prime squared. And so now I hope you see why I didn't, I labeled my coordinate systems the way I did, because if I had made uh, the prime coordinate system, the rotating one, all of these terms that I've had to write out would have primes in them and it would be unmanageable. So I did not do that. Okay. So now we have to square this. So again, we'll just square each term and then we'll do the cross terms afterwards. So in blue, we've got y dot squared cosine squared of omega t. In the orange, we've got y squared omega squared sine squared of omega t. And since I've already color coded these, you should start seeing some things that will simplify. Um, in red, we've got x dot squared sine squared of omega t. In black, we've got x squared omega squared cosine squared of omega t. In pink, got negative two y dot y omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t. Then in light blue, we've got plus two x dot y dot sine of omega t cosine of omega t. And in dark green, we've got uh, plus two y dot x omega cosine squared of omega t. And so the second row came from taking the first term and multiplying it by each of the subsequent terms. And then there's a two in front because uh, you have to if you multiply one direction, you'll multiply the next direction later on. Uh, so we'll just take care of the two right away. Then for the last row of terms, we'll be taking the second term times the third and the fourth term. And then the final term will be the third term times the fourth. Okay. Um, so in light green, we've got minus two x dot y omega sine squared of omega t. In light and purple, we've got minus two x y omega squared sine of omega t cosine of omega t. And then in yellow, we've got two x dot x omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t. Okay, so now we have all of our terms. They're all nicely color coded. Uh, so you should start to see things that are going to simplify already. For example, the x terms, you've got a sine squared and a co or the red terms, you've got a 
cosine squared and a sine squared. So that'll simplify to one for the gold or the yellow term. You'll see you have a positive and then um, ah, this should have been negative. And then for the light blue terms, you'll see that we've got a negative up here and a positive down here. So those will cancel. In the purple, you've got a positive up here and a negative down here. So that'll cancel. And the pinks, you have a positive up here and a negative down here that'll cancel. So we'll write all that down in the next slide. So for the red terms, we had x dot squared cosine squared of omega t plus x dot squared sine squared of omega t. So that's x dot squared times sine squared of omega t plus cosine squared of omega t. So of course you have the relationship that sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And so this is just leaves you with x dot squared. So I'm not going to write that middle step for all of them, but now that you've seen it, you can you know what I'm doing. So for black, we've got x squared sine squared of omega t plus x squared omega squared cosine squared of omega t. That equals x squared omega squared in blue. We have y dot squared sine squared of omega t plus y dot squared cosine squared of omega t. And so remember, this is coming from us doing x dot prime squared plus y dot prime squared. And so those blue term leaves you with a y dot squared. In orange, we had y squared omega squared cosine squared of omega t plus y squared omega squared sine squared of omega t. And that equals y squared omega squared. For the yellow term, we had minus two x dot x omega sine omega t cosine of omega t plus 2x dot x omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t that goes to zero. Light blue, same story. minus two x dot y dot sine of omega t cosine of omega t plus two x dot y dot sine of omega t cosine of omega t equals zero. For the light green, we have negative two x dot y dot or negative x two y omega cosine squared of omega t and then a negative two x dot y 
omega sine squared of omega t. And so the sine and cosine will reduce to one. And you're left with negative two x dot times y. Then for the dark green, we have positive two x y dot omega sine squared of omega t. I forgot to write the omega up here. Plus two x y dot omega cosine squared of omega t equals positive two y dot x omega. And then two more terms. So we've got this purple which was negative two x y omega squared sine of omega t cosine of omega t. And then we had a positive two x y omega squared sine of omega t cosine of omega t goes to zero. And then the last term, pink, we had 2y dot y omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t minus 2y dot y omega sine of omega t cosine of omega t. Okay, so all of that math and now if we wrote x dot prime squared plus y dot prime squared, and then we can add in the z term, because that's easy. We'll get the red term, which is x dot squared, the black term, which is x squared omega squared, the blue term, which is y dot squared, the orange term, which is y squared omega squared, then the light green term, which is negative two x dot y omega, and the dark green term, which is plus two y dot x omega. And then we'll have a plus z dot squared. Okay, so if we rewrite that over here, x1 dot prime, or x prime dot squared, y prime dot squared, and z prime dot squared. So if I group some things together, looks like this, x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared plus omega squared times x squared plus y squared and then plus two omega times negative x dot y plus y dot x. Okay. Now, this might not look like anything to you, um, but there are some clues that we will be able to simplify this. So first let's write the, so x plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared is just something that we'll call r. So r dot prime squared equals r dot squared plus omega squared times x squared plus y squared plus two omega negative x dot y plus y dot x. Okay, so the first clue that we have is that we have three terms and two of them are squared. So this is probably gonna be something that's, that looks like term one plus term two squared. 
because there's two squared terms and then there's two times some quantity. And then the other clue that we have is that this um, x dot times y and y dot times x. So anytime you have those kind of crossing terms where uh, an x component is multiplied by a y component and a y component is multiplied by an x component, it's usually a sign that there's been a cross product done at some point. And so I'm going to show you what these two terms are, and then we're going to prove that that is, in fact, the, the right answer. So what this is going to simplify to is r dot plus omega cross r quantity squared. And so remember that these are all vectors. I haven't been writing them like vectors, but they are vectors. And so let's prove that this is the case. Okay, so this is what we are claiming is the solution. And so now let's prove that this is the case. So whenever you have vectors and you're squaring a vector, what that means is that you're taking the dot product between the two vectors. Okay, so now let's look at what before we go on, let's look at what this omega cross r equals. So omega we uh, defined was the rotation about the z axis. So this is omega times z hat. And we're doing the cross product between r vector, which is x, x hat plus y y hat plus z, z hat. Now, the cross product, when we take z cross z, we get zero. When we do z hat cross x hat, we get y hat. So this is omega x y hat. When we do z hat cross y hat, we get negative x hat, so we get negative omega y x hat. And so now let's plug that in for both of these omega cross r's. So we have r vector dot plus omega x y hat minus omega y x hat. dotted with r vector dot plus omega x y hat minus omega y x hat. All right, so doing the FOIL method, the first term is just r dot times r dot, so that's r dot squared then we'll get two r dot vector dotted with omega x y hat minus omega y x hat plus omega x y hat minus omega y x hat dotted with itself, omega x y hat minus omega y x hat. Okay, so this first term is just r vector dot squared. This second term is two times 
So our vector dot is x dot x hat plus y dot y hat plus z dot z hat. And then we're dot producting that with omega x y dot minus omega y x dot. And then we've got the last term, which is omega x y hat minus omega y x hat dotted with itself. Okay. So this first term just gets carried down. The second term you have, so we're doing a dot product now. So this y hat term is only gonna multiply by the y hat term. So we're gonna get y dot omega x, the two in front, then the x hat is only going to be multiplied by the x hat. So we get a negative 2 x dot omega y. The z hat doesn't contribute at all. And that's all that we have to do. So really, you, you should be multiplying each term by each other. But because it's a dot product, the x hat dot the y hat is zero. The y hat dot the y hat we did. And then the z hat dot the x and y hat uh, give you zero. So really, the, if you're doing a dot product, the only things you have to multiply are the ones that have the same unit vector. OK, so now for the last term, again, because it's a dot product, we only need to do the like hatted term. So That'll give you omega squared y squared and plus omega squared x squared. And so if we factor stuff out again, you'll see that. So we can factor out a 2 omega, and we're left with y dot x minus x dot y plus omega squared times x squared plus y squared. And if you look on the previous slide, uh, this is exactly what we had before. So. This equation is the same as this equation. OK, so now that we've proven that this is a simpler way to write it, we can include that in our Lagrangian. So we've taken this Lagrangian, which was for stationary coordinates, and it was written like x dot prime squared plus y dot prime squared plus c dot prime squared. And now we've rewritten it in terms of the rotating coordinates, r dot plus omega cross r squared. All right. Now we can write our Euler-Lagrange equation. So first, we take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to r dot. So this whole term has an r dot in it. So this will be m times r dot plus omega cross r. Then if we take the time derivative of that, we'll get an r double dot, then this omega term is a constant, and r will just become r dot.
Then for the other term in the Euler Lagrange, we do partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to R. So again, we'll have a the two will get pulled down, so we'll just have m times r dot plus omega cross r. And now we have to multiply by this term inside. And because of the rules of cross products, we can't just multiply by omega. We have to do cross product with omega. Okay. So now these are the two terms that are going to go into our Euler Lagrange. So for Euler Lagrange, we have the total time derivative of partial derivative with respect to i dot equals partial derivative with respect to r. So this is mr double dot plus m times omega cross r dot equals m times uh, r dot plus omega cross r cross omega. So you'll see that there's an m in every term, so we'll get Rid of that. On the right hand side, we have to, when we distribute this cross product, you have to keep its position in the same spot. So it'll be r dot cross omega plus omega cross r cross omega. Okay. Now let's put everything on the same side. So we get R double dot plus omega cross R dot equals or minus R dot cross omega minus omega cross R cross omega. And this all equals zero. Now using the some properties of cross products, we can write negative r dot cross omega as positive omega cross r dot. So we'll get r double dot plus omega cross r dot plus omega cross r dot. And now we can get rid of the negative sign here by saying omega cross omega cross r, where we brought this last omega to the front. Now you see there's omega cross r dot, omega cross r dot, so that'll give you two omega cross r dot. And what we're left with is r double dot plus omega cross omega cross r plus two omega cross r dot equals zero. So now, even without any uh, forces or potential energies applied to this object, just by having an object in a rotating coordinate system, we get these two extra terms in our equations of motion when we use the, our Lagrangian mechanics to find the equations of motion. So what are these two extra terms? So these are actually the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force. And so again, I'm putting quotes in quotation marks because these are not forces in the sense that uh, they're caused by some potential, there's no potential energy associated with them, there's not a force carrying uh, particle associated with them. 
Uh, so these are fictitious forces because they don't have any of those properties, but we call them a force because they have the same units as a force. And so the centrifugal force is one that most people would be familiar with. So if you're driving in a car and the car is going around a turn and you feel some force uh, as you're making that turn, uh, that's gonna be the centrifugal force. The Coriolis force is something that you probably haven't experienced directly, but that you have seen the consequences of. Uh, for example, the uh, rotation of large storms like hurricanes and typhoons, the uh, spiral of that storm, uh, the direction that it rotates is due to the Coriolis force. And so if you look at the Coriolis force, you'll see that it depends on an R dot term. And so the Coriolis force only affects things that are, uh, that have some velocity. And it has to be a velocity that's perpendicular to uh, the rotation of your uh, coordinate system. So if you're sitting still, uh, you're not going to feel a Coriolis force, but for something very large that's moving like air in or clouds in a, a big hurricane, uh, then you will be feeling a Coriolis force. Something else that experiences a Coriolis force uh, are things like missiles. So when you're launching a missile, uh, it travels for long distances and it is moving so it has some velocity. And therefore, uh, wherever that missile is going to land is going to be influenced by this Coriolis force. So for something like a missile launch, you need to take the Coriolis force into account. Um, uh, kind of the motivation for doing, for introducing this is that uh, to solve the three body problem and specifically the restricted three body problem for a satellite at the, in the earth moon or the earth sun system, we are going to treat the um, earth sun system as a kind of background rotating system that we insert our satellite into. And because the earth sun system is rotating, uh, we need to use this rotating uh, coordinate system that's going to have effects from the centrifugal and the Coriolis force. And as we'll see, the centrifugal force is actually needed to generate Lagrange points. And the Coriolis force will, have, will help us um, show that there are actual stable Lagrange points. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Keep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.